It's Jesus calms the storm. I think you probably heard this one. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this passage is titled, In Most of our Bibles, Jesus Calms the Storm. But I like to think of it as the eye of the storm. For it's not so much about the result of Jesus calming the storm, but how his disciples react to being in the midst of the storm itself. And the story occurs at the end of Jesus' long and arduous day of teaching in the boat at Capernaum. This is the part of Mark's Gospel where if he had expanded the gospel as Mark and Matthew and Luke had, the Sermon on the Mount would have appeared there. So he was teaching all day long. And so evening is falling, and Jesus tells the disciples to cast off into the water and says, let's go over to the other side. So he sets the course to the east, sailing from Galilee on the west coast of the sea to the region of the Gerasenes, which is a Gentile area. Um, Jesus would once again perform many miracles in that place. Jesus climbed into the back of the boat. He was exhausted. And he fell soundly asleep. And around the boat, we're told, the other boats sailed off with him, carrying other followers that he had called. But in the boat with him were the, were the uh, apostles. They move out into the open water. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat against the boat so that it was soon swamped. Now, those of you who have a boat know what swamped means, right? It means you're sinking because your boat's full of water. It's a scary thing. Now, the Sea of Galilee, I mean, it, it, you know, sometimes it's called the Galilean Lake also. It's not really big. I mean, I've been there. Um, it's eight miles wide and 13 miles long. I mean, that's, that's not really big. Um, but you know, the way that it's situated, it has these high hills that surround it and they're cut with deep ravines that act like great funnels of water and wind that come down from the heights onto the lake without warning. And freak storms would arise suddenly. So the disciples, many of whom were fishermen, they were experienced boatmen, they would have been used to having these kinds of storms come up. It's it was a predictable uh, it was a phenomenon that they would have really been used to, and they survived those storms um, in the past. They knew what to do. They knew how to handle themselves in the boat. But the scripture doesn't tell us what, if anything, they did or to do in, in riding out the safety of the storm. How long they kept trying to do it. Did they bail water? We don't know. But perhaps it's sheer suddenness. And the uncontrollable intensity caused them to know immediately that they were out of their depth. The immediacy of the Greek wording, and I think it doesn't come through in the English translation here very much, supports this idea. Because it, it, it really says, there came about a fierce gust of wind, and the waves were beating against the boat so that it was already filled with water. So this tremendous power that's unleashed by the wind was like nothing they'd ever seen before. And yet as the disciples panicked, fearing for their lives, Jesus slept soundly in the back of the boat. 
As the wind roared about them, roiling up the water and tossing the boat to and fro, Jesus was sleeping peacefully. Love the picture, don't you? That's what we need to see is Jesus sleeping peacefully. As the water filled the bottom of the boat, soaking the cushion on which he lay, Jesus was sleeping in heavenly peace. In the midst of such chaos and turmoil, Jesus rested in the everlasting arms of his Father, unperturbed, an oasis of peace like the calm in the eye of the storm. Now the chaos and turmoil which ruled the waves outside the boat now surged inside as the disciples were overcome with waves of fear. And their fear spilled outward as they approached Jesus and were told they shook him, rousing him from sleep and yelling into the wind, Teacher! Do you not care that we are perishing? You know, it's intriguing when we look at this account because Matthew and Luke also have it to see how they recorded the disciples' reaction to the storm. Matthew's version re reads, Lord, save us. We're perishing. And Luke says, Master, Master, we are perishing. But Mark's disciples don't waste any words. There's no deferential address to Jesus as Lord and Master. No cry for help. We are perishing. Save us. Mark's disciples cry out in accusation and in frustration that they are helpless. Don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing? They foresaw only that they were perishing, and perishing meant to them not only death, but complete annihilation, destruction, being smashed to pieces by those waves which threatened to break their boats into splinters along with their bones. Jesus is roused from his sleep by the disciples, and he stands, and he rebukes the wind, and he spoke to the lake, with just three words. Be still, be silenced. <laughs> then the wind dies down, and there's a great calm. And as Jesus spoke, it was as if that great calm that he possessed on the inside was exhaled into the air, and the fierce gust immediately became a great calm. Then he spoke again this time to the disciples. Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have faith? It seems that the disciples barely heard the question. Immediately, we're told they are filled with an awful dread. Or as the literal Greek translation says, they were afraid with a terrible fear. In the storm surrounding the boat, they were panicked with fear, but now they were consumed inside with a terrible fear that put them in awe. They faced each other, and they questioned each other. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I think the disciples were asking a rhetorical question here. They knew the answer. They finally knew. The creative voice which spoke to the wind and the water and spoke it into being many, many years ago had spoken once again. The same commanding voice which was heard in the Psalms as more majestic than the thunder of the mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, had just summoned to the sea again. The disciples heard the voice of God. And this moment was an epiphany for them, this instant of sudden intuition and understanding that they were in the presence of Almighty God. Before this point, only the demons had recognized Jesus as God in flesh. The disciples had known Jesus as an authoritative teacher, a charismatic healer, and they were drawn by his powerful deeds and his merciful actions but they still had difficulty in fathoming his words about the kingdom of God. They may have understood that he was Messiah, but Jesus didn't fit their expectations of the one who would deliver them from, from Rome. They expected one who would conquer by means of insurrection and the sword, freeing Israel from the Roman yoke. 
that Jesus in his words, his actions, and his demonstrations of his unfailing love and patient grace wanted them to see that he was the Messiah in a much different way. That he would bring the kingdom of God, not with a sword, but with a sword of love that would pierce their very souls. The raging storm on the Sea of Galilee, when they understood that they were no longer in control of their destinies, when their life skills failed them, when they heard death calling to them in the howl of the wind, they saw God in their midst, just as Jesus intended. Now the disciples were never in any real danger when they set out in their boats. They didn't know this, though. Because Jesus had already told them what their destination was. They were to go to the other side. Jesus set their course. And Jesus, even as he slept, piloted their boat for them. The one who created the seas at the beginning of the world possessed the supreme authority and sovereignty over them. He could stir up a storm or he could quell it at any time. And though he slept, he never lost his sovereignty over the natural phenomena. It was while he slept, the storm blew up, and I think perhaps Jesus formed that storm. He employed the storm to deepen the faith of the disciples. The sovereign Lord of the universe, the creator of the very sea on which he slept, was also the creator <coughs> of and sovereign Lord over their lives, the lives of these men and women who were tossing in these boats around him. You see, this story is really about God's sovereignty and our faith. God is sovereign in our lives. Whether we want to admit it or not or notice it or not, he sets the course and he tells us the destination. He even goes with us in the boat, though sometimes we forget he's here. But like that serene calm that's in the eye of a hurricane, Jesus is right here in the boat with us, exuding that supreme peace and sovereignty in the midst of our storms. Every one of us will find ourselves in the eye of the storm sometime in our lives, maybe more than once. Personal storms, where bodily and mental anguish and illness suddenly threaten to consume us. Emotional storms of anger, jealousy, worry that cloud our every thought and action. Relational storms when tension strains to the breaking point. Our relationships with parents, spouses, children, siblings, friends, co-workers, and even church family. Situational storms when circumstances are against us and everything seems to go wrong no matter what we do and even spiritual storms, when a sudden change plots anew an undetermined course for a people of God. But seldom in history has a storm hit the entire world in a global tsunami that has beaten against every country on earth. And over the past two years, such a storm has raged with a tenacious virus that has produced sickness and death and fear and anguish that has produced personal, emotional, relational, and situational and spiritual storms in just about everyone on the globe in some way. And just as that storm seems to be receding, <clears throat> at least in the view of politicians, bureaucrats, and the media, haven't heard too much about it on the news lately, have you? Why? <laughs> because an even more dire and potentially final storm for the whole Earth threatens to develop into a nuclear war in Ukraine. Storms are unpredictable. They appear suddenly. Storms are impartial. They happen to everyone, even to Christians, by the way. Like the disciples, we're in the middle of a raging storm right now. When we are no longer in control of our destinies, when our life skills are failing us, and when death calls in the howling of the wind, we may believe that we are alone. But Jesus is right here with us. 
We may believe that though he is with us, that Jesus is asleep and is either unaware or doesn't care that we are perishing. We may fear that Jesus is powerless to defeat this storm. Yet it's in the eye of the storm that we are brought into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ and our faith is deepened. In that life and death moment, every other distraction falls away and through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, we can see clearly that we're not alone. And we rouse from the slumber in our own minds to see that the Lord is not sleeping. He is with us. He is always with us. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us, though we often leave him behind or we push him out of our sight as we try to navigate for ourselves. Now that may work in calm waters. And we've had the blessing of calm waters a lot in our lives. It works for a while. But it doesn't in the eye of the storm. The question for those who would follow Christ is not whether we will come through the storm. Jesus has set our destination for us. And he is with us throughout the journey. We will arrive at the other side. The question is this, what will we do in the eye of the storm? Will we panic, crying out to the Lord, don't you care? Don't you care about me, Jesus? Or will we be at peace, knowing that Jesus is right here, right here beside us, in an oasis of calm and peace in the eye of the storm? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are always with us, especially in the eye of the storm. Though we try to handle difficult times by ourselves, though we do not seek you until it seems almost too late, though we let your love for us sleep until we think that we really need it, you ask us only to have faith that your love for us is big enough to include both the little things in the dailiness of our lives, as well as the monumental strains that also appear throughout our lives. Lord, may we rest in your love and peace in the tsunami that batters the world now. You, and only you, are the calm in the eye of the storm. We thank you and we praise you. And we are in awe that you love us so. Amen.